Okay, recording now. Um, let me turn off the music. So, welcome everybody. It's um, a bit of an unusual talk I'm going to give today. Um, it's about notation, so it's a bit of an experiment really, and uh, I hope it works out. Um, as you all know, um, notation is is very important it's the it's the written language of mathematics and uh, and uh, of course <coughs> we all communicate with languages um, animals communicate uh, but um, humans I think have a different way of communicating I mean about I th as far as I understand, about 70,000 years ago, we started talking in terms of stories. And, um, and that's, that was an incredible advance. I don't think other animals talk in terms of stories. If you've got a story, you know, if you're a, a caveman, you can say, uh, hi, Ugg. Um, if you go down the river and get to the first bend and then on the right hand bank there's a herd of buffaloes or um, whatever and um, so that's a, a kind of descriptive thing and, and then you can go into the future and start planning things so you say uh, hi Ugg, let's let's uh, Let's go to where we've seen these buffaloes and um, maybe we can kill one or two with our, um, our new invention, the spear. Uh, and then, you know, the <coughs> you can um, not only do that, but, but you could do explanations. So, uh, for instance, um, have you ever wondered why the sky doesn't fall down? Well, it, it's held up by four turtles or something, you know. I mean, you've got these, these stories, um, but now mathematical notation is, um, is different because language changes, of course, over time. Um, uh, it doesn't, um, it doesn't get any better, but mathematical language actually improves. It changes. I mean, uh, Elizabethan English is, um, is slightly different from, um, from modern English. Um, it, it's not any better or worse. Um, some might, people might say it's better. But on the other hand, if you look at mathematical notation from Elizabethan times, um, it's, it's so much better now. Um, and it leads to all sorts of um, improvements. So, you know, I mean, mathematical language improves uh, over, the, over the years. So let me try and share something with you. Um, uh, let's have a look at that. Now, where are we? Um, right. Can anybody see that? Or do I have to go out and come in again? Probably. Um, it's all, I never quite know how this thing works. Um, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Right. So, um, as I say, this is a bit of a strange talk, but there is an interplay between not theory and physics, which you, you all know about, and it's, um, and it's partly to do with notation, and it's uh, it's very interesting. So, what's slide two? Oh, okay. So here, 
we have the beginnings of mathematical notation with the tally stick. You see, so um, you just make a mark on a on a tally stick, and so in that way, numbers are formed. And this is a uh, this was um, I mean, this is fifty thousand years old or something. It's uh, it's a this idea was long before anybody thought of writing down speech as um, this so mathematical notation came long before um, and you see you, you just make a, a mark every time say a sheep passes by and that, that tells you how many sheep you've got in the field um, of course it's it's a bit um, I don't know if this is they try I mean each time you it, you can't sort of People find it very difficult to grasp more than four things at once. Um, so you know that's why you invent a new uh, a new mark for uh, five. Um, I think I think that's what they've been doing here on this uh, on this bone. Um, but it's the beginnings of um, Roman numerals. Which, of course, are, were invented long before the Romans. Um, so here we are, counting as at least fifty thousand years old, tally sticks, and you start making a mark: one, one stroke, two stroke, three strokes, four strokes. And then, if you keep on just doing strokes, it's very difficult to see what's going on. But you can put a line across when you come to five, and or you can symbolize it as the five fingers of the hand um, and if you've got two hands you've got ten so that makes a, a cross okay which is easy uh, to see that's why you get x for ten um, but on the other hand it's it's hopeless for calculating i mean you know you can't multiply uh, or divide using um, Roman numerals. Um, it's that's why you need an abacus. Now I suspect it was using an abacus, which meant the um, the position uh, of you know the the digits to um, that that's how they were invented. Um, but as I say, I, I'm not an expert on this, and and um in fact if anybody's got any comments to make uh during the lecture if they think i've said something stupid do interrupt let's have a look at slide five now good notation leads to better maths um <laughs> it's extraordinary to think that the plus sign only came in in 1360 and the minus sign in 1489 um, and of course, once once you give a name to something, it's, um, it's you have power over it. It's, it's like juju. Uh, and then Euler introduced I for the, the standing for imaginary, of course, the square root of minus one. Um, and what I want to show is certain notations in knot theory. Um, uh, lead to discoveries. So, um, ah, Lou, better late than never. Um, now, mathematical notation is, um, is simultaneously ambiguous and unambiguous, which is a real um, power because, you know, you could, you could take, and I still haven't worked out how to put mathematical notation here but so you'll have to put up with um peg so um so we've got a we've got x which is a real number and x now stands for uncountably many possibilities it's, um, and we can manipulate it um i think i'm going to um could everybody um mute themselves if that's possible 
Um, ah, that's better. Okay. Um, of course, uh, if you want to ask a question, you, you know, do do uh, unmute yourself. But uh, okay. So we've got um, x is a real number. It's uncountable possibilities. We can manipulate x. We can notation of course for multiplying and so on uh, but it could also be definite you know it can be free for instance so um, it, it's kind of like magic in a way um, when I was um, when I was young eight or nine I was absolutely fascinated by mathematical notation um, and uh, Here's, here's a page from Tate's book on quaternions. And I mean, all these sort of Greek symbols and so on. And um, I think it was lovely. Theta, phi, wow. You know, cos, what is that? Sine, so on. Um, and then, and this was uh, putting, this, uh, putting this together was a skilled art for the uh, typesetter. Um, and of course it was very expensive. And so, and there was a, a period in the seventies before tech was invented, when um, things were just written with a typewriter. Um, so here's an example, nice book there, um, with beautiful diagrams. Um, and of course, all the, all the, uh, this is all, typewritten um, and um, but uh, that's lovely uh, what have I got next but and we've got not theory we've got our own notation so which is being invented all the time if we if we do a not diagram then we have a crossing and we have a an idea that this kind of crossing is is right-handed uh, and the idea is that this arc goes over this arc okay and um, if if this one goes over this one then that's a negative crossing okay and um, and then this was extended by um, by Lou uh, to to uh, mean a virtual crossing uh, so it's a, it's a crossing here with a circle around it, but it also stands for a weld as well. So once again, we've got we're starting to introduce ambiguity, um, and um, and then uh, then the work I'm doing with with Andy Bartholomew, you just put a cross here and then you put an X there, and then that can that can stand for all sorts of things. The X. Uh, um, it could be V, which is, uh, which is, no, it could be R, sorry, that's, I can't even read my own writing. R for, say, a real crossing, or V for a virtual crossing, W for a weld, D for a doodle, and uh, S for a singular crossing, etc., etc. So, um, you know, notation is being invented all the time. Uh, now, do I want to, not sure, no, we'll come back to that in a minute. Let me stop sharing for now. And, um, hi Lou. Uh, but I want to share again and go to here. So let's uh, right now. Oh, I bet you can't see that. Um, right. Uh, okay. Can somebody? Say, um, Dale, can you see that? Put your put your hand up. Okay. <laughs> so I see it. you see it. Okay, good. Right. 
Um, so mathematics is the handmaiden of science. Uh, excuse the um, sexist language, uh, but you imagine um, a physicist, um, he's uh, working away, he's, he needs some mathematics, in comes a handmaiden with mathematics on a, a gold tray and hands him something and uh, is then dismissed. Um, and of course, um, uh, you know, the working physicist is probably not so bothered about whether the mathematics is correct as long as it leads to an answer which fits in with um, his ideas. Um, in fact, I, uh, a story which was told to me by, by, um, by Vaughan was that when he was attending a, a physics lecture, when he was learning his craft, um, he remembers the lecturer going through some Fourier analysis, completely, uh, completely wrong. I mean, it was, um, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, mathematically correct at all, but somehow that didn't matter to him. At the end of the day, he got to some physics, which uh, he proved, uh, which he was happy with using this, this mathematics. So now what happens? Okay, so this is something which um, physicists used. Uh, they to, they're called ket vectors. Um, and they represent states. Um, and they are denoted, denoted by symbols such as this. So you've got a, an upright, um, an A, and then a bracket here. And uh, this is a useful notation, in fact, very good notation, because whatever's inside here, this A, it, it could be a number or it could be uh, could be a concept, could be an experiment, whatever. So that's quite good. Um, and in fact, uh, if we look at the co-space, um, these are bra vectors, they're called bra vectors by physicists, denoted by symbols such as this. So now the bracket is on the other side and this notation is due to Dirac, uh, who uh, I might have told you was at school with my uncle, along with uh, Cary Grant. Um, and then this isn't working so well. Um, and then the idea is that if you put them together, you get a bracket. So, um, if these are vectors, then this is uh, the evaluation of A on B, which is a complex number or whatever field you're working in. Uh, and there's another useful notation. If you, if you write two things, A, B, that's the tensor product of A and B. So that's, uh, that's useful. So, um, So a mathematician would represent a ket vector as a sort of column vector, probably, and um, a bra vector as a row vector. So that when you evaluate, um, you've got this uh, complex number, which is the inner product of those two. Um, right, now if we reverse the order, we get a ket to bra. So we got the column first, then the row, and then this gives an n by n matrix, like that. So um, now why is that useful? I think because it defines a Hermitian operator where you, if you put them together, if you so take this ket bra and then act upon a ket, so the bra and the ket together makes a bracket, which you can take out because it's just a number. And, um, and so that's taking this 
this ket vector A to this uh, a multiple of this ket vector B, right? So, um, and then why is that useful? Uh, if B is a unit vector, so um, so the, the length of B is one, or the inner product of itself with, is one, then P, which is this um, ket bra operator, has an eigenvalue one with eigenvector B, and that's it, that defines its image. You see, everything goes to B. Whatever you do, um, it's just some multiple of B. So it's, um, it's a projection onto the space span by B. Um, and uh, if P is this uh, <coughs> um, kept bra, BB and Q is this kept bra AA, so these are now unit vectors, then P squared is P and Q squared is Q, that's because they're projections. But PQP is lambda P and QPQ is lambda Q, where lambda is the inner product squared of A and B. And um, so what significance is that? Well, you, this is beginning to look a lot like the temporally leave algebra. Okay, and I just wonder if people would have spotted this if it hadn't been for this notation. But um, I think, I think you, you want, want to give Kaufman credit for, for this observation. observation. Ah, I suspect that was Kaufman who just said that. <laughs> Am I correct? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, Yes. Okay. So, definitely. You, well, that's the second time Kaufman has been um, uh, credited, right? So there we go. Um, um, did Did you see it from the point of view of this notation? You think? Yes, certainly. Right. Okay. That's good. Right. Now I'm going to unshare this for now. Roger. Yes. Uh, oh, if you're thinking about P as being summation over B or just a particular... Uh, particular no, no, it's, it's just... Um, I'll, I'll go back to that. Um, just so you get it right. Um, you see, P is this um, oper Hermitian operator. You see, it's a ket bra. And it acts upon a ket here. You see that this this bra here now interferes with this a, so to make the inner product, and so which is just a complex number times the ket b. Do you get that? Yeah, sure. But if um, you sum over, um, say, all b in a basis. Oh well, well this uh, th th this here is a summation, of course. It's the inner product. Yeah, so that will be a sum. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I think I know what you mean. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now um, let me have a, a look at a picture. Um, okay. So, as I say, we've got this notation here. Now, look, if you think about this as a pictorial representation, and this is, this is what Lou presumably discovered to his credit. So, we, we've got the temporally leave. We've got a kept bra here. And yeah, I, I should mention, Roger, that I didn't <laughs> discover the diagrammatic for temporally leave algebra from the bras and kets. No. I noticed it afterwards, oh. after discovering that way of thinking. Okay. But you will agree with me that it's notation which has led to this discovery. Oh, I, I do not agree. It led to 
I, I discovered the notation for the temporary Lieb algebra, the cups and caps notation for it, quite independently of bras and kets, but then understood uh, after a long time, actually, that it was that bras and kets were an example of it. Right. Okay. So if we, as I say, look at this combination here, so that we join up, we've, we've got a, a ket bra here and um, uh, a ket, uh, a, with a different sort of symbol for the, instead of an angle, we've got a square bracket here and put them together and we've got uh, this curved line here and we, which we would like to straighten out and then we get what what we wanted we we've, we've come back to a, a ket bra and but how do we know we can do this and the devil's in the detail because how do we know we can straighten this out uh and i think um lou is going to talk about that next week is that correct sure i can talk about that yeah okay um Right, so um, right. So, okay, so as I say, this is a beginning to look like the Templi Leave algebra and um, and I'll leave the how this develops into the Templi Leave algebra for next week. Now I want to talk about a, um, uh, a notation which is, uh, which goes back to the 19th century, <clears throat> um, but has recently been adopted by physicists. And it's quite interesting and so I'd like to share it with you. So first of all, you can make an alternating product uh, whenever you can make a tensor product, you see. You just, um, you take two R modules, then, then this, um, this alternating product of modules is the quotient R module, where we take the tensor product of the two uh, modules and divide out by this two-sided ideal generated by um, A tensor B plus B tensor A. In other words, that's going to be zero when you, when you quotient out. So in other words, A wedge B is going to be minus B wedge A. Okay. Now, what does this all mean? Um, if, we've got, uh, if we've got Rn, Okay, the n-dimensional real space. Um, this is an oriented parallelogram. Uh, it, it's not a vector like the cross product because that only ha only exists when n is three and seven. As you know, the cross product exists when n equals uh, three um, because of quaternions, if you like, uh, and it exists uh, when n is seven because of octonians, okay? So, so we think of A wedge B as a little bit of oriented um, parallelogram, okay? Oriented this way round, and if it was B wedge A, then it would be oriented the other way round, okay? Um, and this algebra goes back to Grassmann and Clifford, in the 19th century. And then we want to talk about the geometric algebra, GA, which I'm not sure if David Heston has invented it, but he's certainly uh, trying to popularize it. So if we take two vectors in Rn and we can define their geometric product to be, well, a dot b, whatever the inner product is, which is a scalar, plus a wedge b, 
So we're kind of mixing two things together here. And we can get back to the other products by, uh, by looking at this. So AB plus BA divided by 2, we'll, which of course will be a, uh, a dot B because B where J is minus A wedge B and it cancels. And then a, a formula for the A wedge B would be AB minus BA. And that uh, gets rid of the dot product because that's symmetric. So um, the idea was that this would be somehow uh, a way of introducing a multiplication in Rn, which would be coordinate free. Uh, so you'd have to decide um, whether this is uh, whether this product here is is associative or not. Um, but of course, the product of two vectors is sub, is not now a vector anymore. It's um, it's a scalar plus plus this uh, a wedge b. So what does that mean? Um, so I looked at this to try and make it associative. This was a suggestion of Lou. Um, and you see, if you want these two things to be equal, we need that a times b wedge c minus a wedge, a wedge b times c is this difference, the difference of these two, two vectors. Um, and well, this works if you, you see you've got to define what you mean by a times b wedge c. And, and if you put it equal to this, that works. But, um, and it's sort of a bit like the triple cross product um, expansion or something. So I put in a minus sign here, but it, you don't have to, you can put a plus sign and it, it would still work. And, and here you've got a wedge b wedge c, which we know is, is associative, but, um, but you don't have to have this term. So there is a, there is a lot of, um, um, you know, a, a lot of decision making about A, B, C, but in order to make it uh, associative. So it's, it's easier if you look, if you, if you do use coordinates. Um, and so I'm going to do it in terms of coordinates. Um, so we take an orthogonal basis of Rn. I haven't explained what the inner product is, um, which is, defines the geometry. But it doesn't matter because you can always find an orthogonal basis of Rn. And, um, and then the, the geometric algebra for Rn is the stroke, which um, would depend on whatever uh, the um, inner product is whatever the between these um i mean we know that the ei dot ej is, is zero if i is not equal to j but ei dot ei well that um, we don't know yet what that is it doesn't matter but we take the stratified direct sum of the following linear subspaces okay so We've got scalars, dimension one, index naught. Vectors, okay, so we've got this basis, EI, I1 up to N, and then bivectors, which are the um, little bits of oriented uh, parallelogram. Uh, Trivectors, which are um, little bits of oriented uh, cuboids and so on uh, up to and there's as far as you can go will be n vectors or um, pseudo scalars which um, they're called they have dimension one and index n and the generator is just the wedge product of all the basis elements and then a multi vector is a linear combination of these items Right, and 
if we do that, then we have a very simple way of describing physics. So let's see what happens with um, the basis elements. EI squared is whatever the inner product of EI with itself is, could be zero. Uh, could be one if it's Euclidean, or it could be minus one in certain cases, as we'll see. Um, and then um, if j i is not equal to j, then it's a skew symmetric and it is the wedge product. Um, and now, so what do we mean now by by say we want to make this 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 product um, uh, associative, so um, it, it's summed up by this example here. Um, so you, you you take an EI which you're going to multiply this by vector here, and what you if I is one, then you just shunt it here because we want these because um, we want we want the, 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 the suffices to, to increase in value. So we just park it there. If I is two, it's just the inner product of E2 of itself times E4 and, and so on. It makes it obvious. If, uh, if I is three, well, then we have to get it past the E2, which will change the sign. So it's minus E2, E3, E4, and then so on. Um, if i is four, it's that. If uh, i is greater than four, it goes past two things. So it's minus minus, it's plus. So it's just e2, e4, ei. Uh, okay, and now we just, so that, that's the definition of the, um, of the product. Um, and then we want a similar formula. So if k is some monomial, of index k, we want a, we want some sort of um, formula like this, which we can work out what it is, and um, it's an a dot k. So this is this was something. This will be something of index k minus one, and a wedge k will be something of index k plus one, and uh, we can define them by this rule here. Okay, just as we did with the vectors. So let's assume for the moment that the geometry is Euclidean. So EI squared is one and EI times EJ is minus EJ EI. Um, the top space of dimension N has dimension one and is generated by this product E1, E2 up to EN. And that's called the pseudo scalar because it's a bit like a scalar. And if you multiply by i n, this defines a duality between k vectors and m minus k vectors. Okay. Um, uh, could, could you go back for just a moment? Um, I'm, yeah. I'm okay. Uh, what, so what is it? The, um, Scott. Unit vector, I'm sorry, I'm getting an echo. The unit vectors, when you multiply them, they don't, they don't have a scalar part? Um, could, well, they could be, you see, if we go back a bit. Um, I know that you defined it in, uh, okay, maybe. See, you might. Um, no, well, just a pair of unit vectors. Yeah, yeah. Is that okay? At the, at the top of that slide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So there's a, a duality between k vectors and n minus k vectors, which you multiply by i n. I n incidentally commutes with everything. So it is like a scalar. And, uh, and this is the important thing. If you square it, it's minus one uh, for half 
the times, if provided k is two or three mod four, um, and of course two and three are going to be uh, our interesting dimensions, as we'll see in a minute. Okay, since the geometry is Euclidean, then non-zero vectors have inverses under this multiplication, uh, and unit vectors are their own inverse. Uh, so we just divide by a dot a, and this will be the inverse of a under this uh, multiplication. <clears throat> right, and one of the most useful ways this, that this um, notation can do is you can define reflections and rotations. So if I take a vector a and I multiply on both sides by a unit vector and uh, negate it, this defines a reflection in the hyperplane perpendicular to n. Um, why is that? Well, if I work out what that means, a times n is a dot n plus a wedge n, and then, uh, but a wedge n we know is a n minus n a over two. So multiplying that out, we get a dot n, which is after all just a scalar times n plus nan over two minus n over two. And if we put, if we do solve for n a n or minus n a n, which is a minus two a dot n n, which is the formula, as you all know, for a reflection in a hyperplane. Um, and if I do it twice, so I multiply now by, on both sides by uh, n, well, I first of all multiply by n, and then I multiply by m on both sides, and two reflections makes a rotation. And this is the rotation through the angle um, between m and n about the co-dimension two subspace perpendicular to n and m, okay? And if I let R be this rotor, Mn, R inverse is Nm, and rotation is this group conjugation, A goes to R, A, R inverse. And that um, gets the physicists very excited because they're always looking at rotations and things. Um, so that's an incredibly useful notation. Right, well, let's, um, let's have a look at um, dimensions two, three, and four, which is what we're often interested in. So we t a typical multi-vector is a sum of um, a scalar um, and then a combination of the two basis vectors and then the product, E1, E2, and remember, E1, E2 is a square root of minus one because uh, we've got n equals two and n equals three, their square is always minus one. So I can write this as x plus i, y, uh, chosen y and x dash to be like that, just so it looks like a um, complex number. And so I have, M can be thought of a multi-vector as a sum of two complex numbers, Z1 and Z2 times E1. Okay, where Z1 is X plus Y E1 E2 and so on, and Z2 is X dash minus Y dash E1 E2. And now we can define multiplication by distribution and using this relation that E1 times so this complex number z is z bar times e1. Okay, so it's it's almost commutative, but not quite. Um, so what about norms, dot products, and inverses, etc.? So let, let's take a typical element um, multivector here. The conjugate is we just uh, take the minus sign of everything except the scalar part. And then 
the inner product is um, a a dash minus b b dash minus c to the third plus d b dash. I put in a, a query here because it, I'm trying to find what corresponds to the bracket notation using this um, perhaps um, perhaps Lou knows, but anyway, the square of the norm of um, a multi-product is just this, a squared minus b squared minus c squared plus d squared. So this has an inverse if a squared plus d squared is not equal to b squared plus c squared. Um, and we can do some calculus. So we let nabla be uh, differentiation with respect to x uh, in the direction of e1 and differentiation with respect to y in the direction of e2. And you find very simply that if I take x plus y and then e1, e2 is i, remember, and x and y are scalars and we're differentiating with respect to x and y and the answer becomes naught. Okay, so if nabla of z is naught, but on the other hand, nabla of z bar, the conjugate, the complex conjugate of z is not naught, it's 2e1. So in general, uh, the uh, differentiation of z to the n is zero um, for any integer n which means we can make a definition. So we call a function from some open subset of the complex plane to the complex numbers. We call it analytic, holomorphic. I'm not sure of the difference. Uh, if nabla of f is zero. In other words, if it's, if it's a cycle in some sense. And um, so that's interesting. And if we, if we write uh, some function, so, which is differentiable as a, a real part, as a real function of two variables, and then another real function of two variables times i, then delta of f is, uh, you'll find e1 times this and e2 times that. Um, but, um, but we want this to be zero uh, in the case of an analytic function. So that would, that implied the two cauchy riemann equations. This, this one is zero and that one is zero. Okay. Let's go to n equals three. And then this algebra is generated by four types. Um, a scalar, a vector, a bivector, and, um, and a scalar times this uh, top product here. Um, and, and this is a pseudo scalar. And notice that we, we, it's still e1, e2, e3 is, is a square root of minus one again. So um, scalars and pseudo scalars lie in the center of this algebra. They commute with everything. Uh, multiplication by this, uh, this i3, which is uh, this element here, i3, e1, e2, e3 defines a bijection between vectors and bivectors. So E1 goes to E2, E3, E2 goes to E3, E1, E3 goes to E1, E2. Um, now this set E1, E2, E3 can be thought of as the set of Pauli matrices, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. So these are these famous two by two matrices with complex entries. And um, this, if I multiply these matrices together, I get sigma one, sigma two is minus i sigma three. Um, oh, 
that is a misprint. Obviously, <laughs> I didn't get around to changing the indices, so <laughs> you'll have to guess what that is. That's a sigma two, that's sigma two times sigma three. Sorry, um, uh, bit of, um, should have checked that. Okay, and uh, I, we're taking here to be this, this top uh, pseudo scalar, which is defining features of the Pauli matrices, what it would be if it was correct. So um, I will alter that. Um, the linear subspace spanned by one E1, E2, E3 is isomorphic to space of Hermitian two by two matrices. And um, uh, we probably knew that. And uh, what about these bivectors, which I've written suggestively as boldface I, it's E2 times E3, boldface J is minus E3, E1, and boldface K is E1, E2. And these are quaternions, okay? Um, the usual generators of pure quaternions. And if we take this state psi and associate it with this quaternion, which we can always write as um, x plus x dash j plus i times y plus y dash j because i j is k, then the action of the Pauli matrices on this um, multi-vector psi is given by, or this quaternion, is given by this formula here, i equals one, two, and three, and it transforms like this. So, um, so we can write a general element in this three-dimensional algebra as S plus a scalar plus a vector, and another scalar plus a vector times I is um, pseudo scalar. And then um, the conjugate of M is just this. We just take minus all the vectors and M M dashed is this. And M has um, an inverse, M inverse divided m bar divided by this uh, product m times m bar and that works provided um, s squared plus the inner product b and b is not equal to t squared plus the inner product of a and a and st is not equal to a dot b okay so that brings us to n equals four now, if we take the usual Euclidean basis of R4, then the square of this top product here is one. Well, we don't want that. We want it to square to minus one, and we can do that by, uh, the physicists use this notation gamma i instead of ei. Um, I, I don't know why particularly, but anyway, we'll go with it. Well, we have a Minkowski metric. <clears throat> so we, we take this as the basis, gamma naught, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. Now gamma naught squared is gonna be one, but for k equals one, two, and three, um, ah, Sergey, you're a bit late. Um, this is, uh, minus the square. So in fact, we, we have here a situation where instead of it being Euclidean, it's a Minkowski matrix um, and the square of gamma k is minus one. And, um, and gamma j times gamma k is, is minus gamma k gamma j. And now if we write i uh, which is I4, which is gamma, gamma naught, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, then the, then the square really is minus one, which is what we want. So, um, 
This defines the space-time algebra, STA, which is what we use for n equals four. Um, and so the, we, we can move the gamma i as um, a moving right-handed orthogonal frame of vectors with gamma naught in the forward light cone. So this is, this is gamma naught corresponds to time and the other two coordinates correspond to space. Um, and if k is a k vector, then ik is minus i to the k, k i, and a multiplication by i defines a duality between k vectors and four minus k vectors. Um, so a typical multivector is of this form. So it's a scalar, a vector, um, a bivector, tau, a trivector, uh, which is a scalar, sorry, which is a vector times i, and now um, and now a scalar times i as the top top dimensional one or the top index one. Okay, and uh, we can split a multi-vector into odd and even parts using this formula here. Now the even multi-vectors form a subalgebra representing spinors, if you know what a spinor is. Um, I'm not sure I do, but the important thing is that they represent rotations which we can take a square root of, I think that's, that's the reason. Um, bivectors form a Lie algebra of the Lorentz group under the um, this commutation product, which is the difference, uh, the commutator of two items here. And then that's a Lie algebra. So you might be interested in that. Um, the reverse of a multivector M is this, which enables us to get um, inverses and so on. And this is the important thing. If, if, if psi is even, it's easy calculations show that if I do psi um, phi, sorry, why don't I say psi? Phi, phi bar is even, in other words, uh, but it doesn't have a bi a bivector component. This is this tau here. So it's um, it's s plus let's say so something like s plus a and um, a, a vector plus a, a scalar times i. So it, it's sort of like a complex number, and um, it is. It, it, you can write it in this form here, where, um, and of course, the rho and beta are, are the real numbers. Um, and um, we've got, uh, we can write anything as, um, we can write any even multivector in this form here, very simple form. And um, and we can do things like find the square root, which is what is so useful. Um, I'm this decomposition has importance for the Dirac theory. So as I say, I'm not uh, an expert on this, but um, but I thought I'd finish with uh, Maxwell's equations. Show how how using this notation, the formula for Maxwell's equation is very simple. So, um, so we take this matrix to be the inner product of gamma i and gamma j. We're imagining now this is a this is a frame, a moving frame, and we take the inner product of gamma i with gamma j, which we're going to write like that, and then gamma i is the reciprocal vector defined by um, gamma i times gamma j is is the chronic of delta. And gamma i is it can be written as this sum. This is a SC means sum, summation convention. Um, and 
we define a derivative as we did before, nabla, which is, um, we take a, a vector, which is, of course, is going to vary um, with um, over space and time. And it's got in terms of coordinates, xi times gamma i, once again, summation convention. And then nabla is gamma i delta i, derivative with respect to x i, and, um, and then, which I've got written here, and then, um, so I just remind you of how Maxwell's equation goes. An electromagnetic field is a bivector value function, F, dependent on space time. It is related to the current density, current density J by Maxwell's equation, which is delta of F is J. So that's F is kind of like a, a, a potential for J and uh, delta F satisfies its uh, div plus curl in some sense here. This is a kind of div of F and this is curl of F and because, um, and then div, and then <coughs> div of F is J um, and curl of F is zero. So that, that defines Maxwell's equations in a very simple form. So uh, I've gone over my time, so I will stop there. Um, are there any questions? Um, let me uh, unmute all. You can all talk if you um, want to. I had a little uh, question right around the time. Okay, Scott, yeah. Can you go back where you introduced the poly matrices? Which ones? Poly matrices. The poly matrices. What these? Well, this we're matrix. not seeing them right now. No. You have to go back to sharing screen. Oh, am I not sharing a screen? Of course not. No. Okay. Um. um Yes, I forget to do that. Uh, okay. uh, is this what you mean? No, further up. Further up. Give me a shout when you see something you... Um, is it in four dimensions? No, it's back in three. Oh, back in three, okay. <clears throat> uh, okay. Here? Uh, I think it's two slides above that. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. okay so, um, uh, this is wrong, you know that, don't you? I've got yeah, 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 sure. sure. I understand yeah. that it's right, but it's, it doesn't tell you everything. Um, yeah. But I, you said that I is equal to I cubed, or I sub three, sorry. Uh, I sub three, oh yeah, yeah. This is, so this is, um, this is E1 times E2 times E3. Sure. Um, there seems like there's an ambiguity uh, with what you mean by the square root of minus one. Um, well, obviously there are several square roots of minus one, but um, yeah, sure, sure. yeah. But uh, um, so the, the, the key the, thing you want here, here is that, that the i should, the I should be a commutative square root of minus, minus one. one. Yeah, which it is. I mean, there are plenty of square roots of minus one which don't commute, but this one does. But um, uh, I three is E one, E two, E three. Is that is that the same as the entry in these matrices? Well, uh, yeah, I think it works through. I mean, 
I mean, I'm just giving the definition as you usually see it. Um, sure. uh, Maybe it's in the slide above that. I'm sorry. Yeah. This one? Um, no, uh, 20, uh, 35. 35. Okay, that's the same thing. Um, I, I guess I'm worried where the poly matrices live. Um, uh, I was thinking about them as two by two matrices over the complex numbers, but uh, it seemed like yeah. But I mean, the yeah. The, the, I mean, the, there is the complex numbers are embedded in here um, with, with I being replaced by e one, e two, e three. Okay. Okay. All right. And that, that answers that. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, well. Thanks everybody for being patient with me um, <laughs> talking about this. Um, next next week, Lou is going to show why the temporary Lee algebra as I've defined it earlier, gives rise to um, uh, the Jones polynomial, or um, a representation anyway of the, of, oh, I've got a chat here. Okay, so, um, oh, everybody thinks, oh, everybody's being very nice, saying they enjoyed it. <laughs> okay. So um, see you same time next week, and um, I'll have a chat with Sam and Lou later in an hour's time, if that's okay. That's right. So, yeah. Bye for now. <laughs>